last time you'll recall, we dealt with uh, neo-colonialism as a kind of resuscitation of a style from the past. And this lecture is the second of two that follow that same, that same pattern that we look at a set of building practices, a set of design practices as a package. And we bring those out of the past and into uh, the contemporary situation. And the contemporary situation is not the same as it was when uh, the architectural package, the cultural package of architecture was first developed. So the new conditions we talked about in the first lecture on the Enlightenment, the new conditions are this new spirit of mankind epitomized by the ideals of the French Revolution, the universal rights of man. Um, and so in the context of those ideals of the Enlightenment, first the classical traditions of Greece and Rome were brought into uh, the present at that time, the uh, 18th century. And uh, it became largely a French project that we talked about last time. Remember Durand and his principles of universal grids? He, uh, we know, we talked about the Nicole de Beaux Arts, the Beaux Arts School of Architecture, and how they attempted to codify the rules of classical architecture so that they could be applied in a modern way with modern programs. So if you're looking for hints on what's likely to be on the quiz, uh, the things that I emphasize when I recap what came before are a great way to, uh, to get a sense of where the priorities are, of course. Um, and in this case, uh, we are going to be looking at the Neo-Gothic or Gothic Revival. We use those terms interchangeably. Gothic Revival, Neo-Gothic, pretty much the same thing, uh, because that's what our author does in the textbook. But we won't just be talking about uh, Gothic style. There's an awful lot of neoclassicism in this lecture as well, because the thing we love most about the Gothic Revival, well, certainly it's a lovable architecture, it's a beautiful set of forms and practices. There's a certain elegance to it because it's fundamentally based in structural scientific physics uh, principles of nature. Uh, but the other thing we love about it is that it was deployed as a cultural instrument for establishing the identity of the new nations of Europe. So you may think that there were always nations, right? We wouldn't blame you if you thought that the nation state was something that started uh, a long, long time ago. But I'm here to tell you it's a new thing. It's a relatively new thing. And some people say it's not going to last much longer. Uh, in the larger arc of history, when the dolphin archaeologists dig up the remains of this ancient civilization that the humans made, uh, they will say, well, look at this cute little time period of a few centuries when those humans had nation states. It was a blip of time in the long run. Uh, there's a good chance uh, that that's all it is. But it's really interesting to see what uh, politicians uh, do what leaders do when they need to mobilize a large population of people. It used to be, we used to uh, say, rally around this religion. And uh, then with the Enlightenment, uh, we displaced religion as the ultimate authority and located it a little bit further down and generalized it, at least in the ideal situation. Uh, and we said, okay, nation states. And in both cases, when you have to rally an entire society behind a certain set of causes or practices, who are you going to call? The architects, 
right? Because architecture is the, the thing that, that works before the internet, before the printing press, before cable TV, before newspapers. There was architecture. Uh, and we'll talk about the role of architecture as a medium for political, economic, social, religious values to promulgate it uh, more widely. Now it's Park Daily, right? Do you guys subscribe to something? Do you look at something? What do you guys look at for your architecture cutting edge news? Park Daily? Anything else? Instagram? There's architecture channels. What is it? Architectural record online. <laughs> you look to him? He always knows what's going on. Uh, so, yeah, so, so uh, it, we didn't have those things before, and so things moved a lot more slowly. But at the same time, one could argue it moved with a much greater impact. Uh, you studied Gothic cathedrals. Uh, what was the purpose of building a Gothic cathedral in your town? Remember that from last fall? Sign of power. It's always the same with that. Whenever a question starts with, what's the point of building and filling the blank? You should say sign of power. Another one. Mobilize the population uh, in terms of uh, bringing them together in a unified activity. Today we would say, ooh, jobs. Right? Let's build that pipeline because, ooh, jobs. Right? Don't believe it. Uh, well, what's another reason to build a Gothic cathedral in your town? What if you're the priest? Why would you like to have a Gothic cathedral to preach in? Is that a symbol? Sure. But if you're trying to save the souls of as many people as possible, it's big. Yeah. So they come like a landmark so more people will come to it? Yeah, we'll see it from a long ways away and they'll come to it. What other uh, trick can I play to get lots of people to come? Let's say from, let's say, all over the world. How can I get people to come to my cathedral from all over the world? Make it really tall. Make it tall, sure, but that's not what does it. Make it a pilgrimage or? Make it a pilgrimage destination by having a piece of the actual cross that Jesus was crucified. Or, if you can't get a hold of that, get a piece of wood and say that it was a piece of the cross, a really old piece of wood, right? So that's a good reason. That was the first tourism. But what about the people of your town or your city? It's probably a city if you have a big cathedral. Or it's probably about to become a city if you have a piece of the true cross. People are going to be coming from all over, so you're going to grow quickly. Lots of tourism. Uh, if you have a lot of people in your town and you want to really, really grab them and win them over hearts, minds, and soul uh, as true believers, what what you're going to do? Make something so beautiful such a powerful manifestation of the glory that is God. Right? I should turn on the reverb for that. The glory that is God. Uh, these people live in thatched huts, basically, in uh, 13th and 14th centuries, with rats in the, in the roof, uh, and you know, the conditions, nothing's more than two stories tall. And imagine what it was like to live in those conditions and then go over to the next town, the town of Sharp, Sharp Cathedral, uh, and you go into the cathedral and it's uh, 
1,500 feet tall in the interior space, and the light is pouring in from above, and it's impossibly tall. And how does that even, it's made out of stone. How does it, how does it even do that? It must be a God. This is the closest we're ever going to get to heaven uh, on earth, is when you walk into a cathedral. So the Gothic is this remarkably powerful tool for promoting tourism, for unifying a population, for conversion and selling people on the promise that it's the kingdom of heaven. So the Gothic is a killer uh, tool for that. So you see what I just did? I said a lot of words, but then I painted a picture with other words. And if I were, if you were only me, uh, if you were more skeptical than you are, you would say, I don't believe you, show me, right? So there is a relationship between words and pictures that is at the very heart of what every one of us does in our careers of architecture. Words and pictures go together. That's why when you open your sketchbook, they're not just pictures. And when you open your sketchbook, it's not just words. And if, you, if I asked you to open your sketchbooks and pick your favorite pages, it wouldn't be a spread that's filled with words, I suspect. And the most useful spreads in your sketchbook are dominated by the image pictures that you've sketched in your sketchbook, but I bet it's even more effective if there are some words in there. So there is a very strong relationship between words and pictures in architecture. Why is that? Why is it so important that it's not just words? First of all, that, that's the easiest one. Why is it so important that we don't just have words? Don't raise your hand, just shout it out. So we can get a picture and a deeper understanding of what's going on. Yeah, so. Uh, why are pictures uh, good at that? Yeah. They communicate visually. So I could say anything I want. Right? This gets back to my number four, believe it or not. It gets back to the enlightenment. If I were your priest, I would tell you things, and you, the true believers, would just buy it because I'm the authority your job to just believe everything you hear me say, right? But I'm not a priest. I'm a professor, and I profess. But you are the skeptical audience. You are the skeptical students. And it's not enough. I'm just number four. It's not enough for me to say it so. I have to prove it. I have to demonstrate it. And even when I do demonstrate it, it's your job to verify. I'm going to tell you, I've been telling you lots of stuff, I'm going to continue to tell you lots of stuff, and a lot of it is correct. To the best of my ability, I'm not saying anything that's wrong. But, like my professors, when they told me stuff, I was, I was a little hesitant, and I needed them to prove it to me, and that's the proper attitude, because I'm just number four. The number one, what's the number one source of understanding? What? Yourself? Your peers are number three? Good thing we're going over this. The world, thank you. Who said that? Thank you. No. 
Um, what's number two? Architectural knowledge. So, number the world itself is the most important source of understanding of the world itself. The world tells us what's going on by knocking us down. Uh, there's no arguing with the world when it has a message like that for you. It will knock you down. You have to get up. And if you don't learn the lesson that the world has to offer you, you will get ready to get knocked down again. Right? So the world teaches us. We have access to an understanding of the world that other people don't have because we're architects. With our training, with our methods, with our hand-eye mind, we are able to access elements of the world that other people don't have access to. So the number two source of understanding comes to us through the methods, skills, tools, and practices of architecture. Number three, your peers, and just number four, when I say something, watch out. It might be true, it might not be true. But more often than not, the way I say it will be confusing to you. I might be speaking a foreign language. As a matter of fact, often I am speaking a foreign language because of the nature of the material. Your job is to not just memorize the words I say, your job is to decode what it is I'm saying with the clues that I'm offering through the visual evidence. So you are decoders. I offer some words. I try my best to verify it with pictures. Your job is to decode it and say, yeah, that's true. Or, no, that's not true. Or more likely, because you're very forgiving, I don't get it. That doesn't ring true to me. Uh, I need more evidence. Uh, and so it's a struggle to grasp and take ownership of what it is that is available to us through the study of this stuff. And so that's why uh, me being number four is part of a larger package of teaching methods. And this is one of the most important rules of this package of teaching methods. We call it Missouri Rules. Why do we call it Missouri Rules? Who's from Missouri? Whose parents are from Missouri? Who's ever been to Missouri? You've been to Missouri? Okay. Did you happen to read the license plates? Even if you haven't been to Missouri, every once in a while, someone gets lost in Missouri and they come to Boston they have a Missouri license plate. What does it say on the Missouri license plate? It says, Missouri, the show me state. Missouri is the show me state. We don't have time to go into the history of why Missouri is the show me state. But Missouri is the show me state. That's all that matters. The rules, the rules of the game in Missouri are, I don't believe you until you show it to me. And that's a very important rule to play by in architecture. When you stand up and give a presentation uh, in the studio, I suggest that you play by Missouri rule number one. You are not allowed to say anything unless you are showing it. Does that make sense? I can show you a drawing, I can show you an image, and I can talk about something else, right? And how's that going to work uh, for me in my final review in the sophomore studio? Is that going to work out well for me? It might if the instructor's not paying attention. But our instructors are pretty sharp. And on most days, you're not going to fool anybody. They might love what you're saying. What you're saying might be wonderful and seductive and, and fantastic. But uh, if it's not supported by the visual evidence, you are in trouble. So Missouri rule number one, if you want to say something, 
you got to show it first. That's why it's called show and tell. It's not called tell and tell. It's not even called tell and show, right? It's show me first, then you're allowed to say it. So um, you have this in-class exercise. And this, let's everybody look at this. So this is something we're going to do today in class. We're going to do it again when, and by we I mean you, you're going to do it again when you do the sketch exercise, the sketch assignment. Sketches assignment that you got on Tuesday. It's kind of the same thing. It's how to put together words and pictures effectively to comply with Missouri rules so that you're not saying anything that isn't verified by the visual evidence. But after you do it today in class, and after you do it for this first sketch assignment, you're done with it, right? You'll never have to do it ever again. What do you think? No. As a matter of fact, there are four sketch assignments, one for each module. But after that, you never have to do it again, right? No. You're going to have to do it again. Because uh, the quizzes sometimes say, Make a sketch to, to support your answer. So it's going to be in the in-class exercise. It's going to be in every one of your sketch assignments. It's going to be part of the, uh, the quizzes. Might even be part of the writing assignments that we're going to give you. The syllabus has the two new deadlines. That's why I've been doing the syllabus for you. It's good to have them take the form. Um, but after that, you'll never have to do this again, right? You will have to do it again. Is that what you think? No. Oh, you'll never have to do it again? Well, this gets back to that question. Some of you will be paying your student loans saying, that was a good deal. My career, my home, my happy family. Thank you, Michael. It worked out very well for me. But not everyone. It takes more than graduating to win this game. You have to graduate with all those skills and all that knowledge and all that ability and all those habits of mind that allow you to shoot to the top of the profession. Because the people around you are going to be the C students from these other schools that don't, didn't really, it kind of went through the motions of their schooling. They didn't grasp and take responsibility for their educations. They were not burglars in the rich person's house. But those of you who are burglars in the rich person's house are going to look at this and they're going to say, well, OK, uh, I'm not sure all of these are very important. I'm pretty sure number four is good. Or I like four and five. But let's see. So you're skeptical. I'm proposing something to you. I'm pitching something to you. It's your job to verify. You might find that only one of these is useful, and so you grab hold of it and you put it in your pocket, and it's the cash that you found in your education. Stuff in your pocket and get out. Some of you are going to say, all of these are important, and you're going to stuff your pockets with it and get out. And then a few of you are going to say, well, that's a good start. But what about 9, 10, and 11? This is incomplete. You're going to go on to become a teacher, and you're going to have a shot at improving on what your teachers offer you. Good luck. Not easy. So this will be on the test. This is the usual thing. Is this going to be on the test? Yes. It's going to be on the test today. It's going to be on the test next. Week. It's going to be on the test. It's going to be on the test at the end, and it's going to be on the test in the studio. It's going to be on the test in every class you take. And then when you graduate, you're all done, right? No. It's going to be 
on the test when you're sitting down in a meeting with your colleagues, and uh, some of you are going to understand how this works well, and the other two colleagues are, are not going to be able to do this. And so some of you are going to get promoted, and others are going to get left behind. Then it's going to be on the test when you meet with your clients. Then it's going to be on the test when you have a competition entry, etc. I'm tested on this every day of my life. I don't know about you, I wish someone had taught this to me. But here it is. If you want to say something, you got to show it. And more often than not, the way you experience this is you say something as best you can, and then you show the evidence, and this is going to happen to you in the studio, actually, this has been happening to you in the studio since you began your education. You show something, and you say something about it, and what you say doesn't really match precisely what it is you're showing. And so what you're showing disciplines you. It teaches you. Your visual evidence is there to point you in the right direction so that you say the right thing. So if you're pointing at something and you're getting it wrong, hopefully the picture will tell you, the picture will directly say, no, that's not right. You gotta rephrase what you're saying. If the picture doesn't do it, then maybe one of your colleagues will do it. Say, no, 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 that's not right. I think what you mean is this. And if your colleague doesn't do it, hopefully your instructor will do it. So that said, a lot of the quiz questions you're going to encounter, and uh, we always call it a quiz, but don't let anyone fool you. When you come into a room and you sit for an hour and a half or more uh, to answer questions, that's not a quiz. Quizzes are small. Quizzes take five, ten minutes. That's an exam. Who's with you? Right? Truth and advertising. Let's call it an exam. If we're going to call it a quiz, we should shorten it, don't you think? OK. The Gothic revival rivaled the revival. See, I could put in a more, I could say, the, the much reviled Gothic revival. I could make this even more complex. I didn't write this. But what characterizes the Gothic revival, and why was it considered more suitable for large civic and religious buildings by some people? Good question. So when you start with questions like this, it helps you focus on what comes later. So as you take in this lecture, look for the evidence, look for the visual evidence that will help support an answer to this question. Here's another question. Name an example of a building that features the Gothic Revival and describe how it employs Gothic structural principles and forms. Structural principles and forms. OK, so as I sit here in this lecture, I'm going to be looking for that. Here's another one. The 19th century and its rapid industrialization in Europe raised concerns of architectural preservation, a new field. Which different schools of thought emerged, and who were the theorists who defined and supported the different schools of thought? Oh, I get it. The teacher wants me to identify different approaches to historic preservation and contrast them, saying this school of thought favored this, but that was opposed by this other school of thought who felt different. So what are the schools of thought, and what are the differences between the two? Describe the contributions John Ruskin made to architecture and architectural theory in the 19th century. So here's a guy, John Ruskin. Who's heard of John Ruskin? You will. And so John Ruskin, see, there's a lot of names that are going to come pouring at you from this screen and from this, these speakers. But maybe John Ruskin might be one of the more important names. And finally, the library Saint Genevieve in Paris is innovative while relating to historic stylistic references. 
describes structure and ornament of the building's exterior and interior and how they are relevant for architecture at the time. Provide sketches. That corresponds very closely with the in class exercise. So that's the open, those are the open questions before us. Is that enough? Now comes the content to fill in the holes that we've just opened up. Hopefully there's some curiosity going on about how we do things. So this is a typical slide in this course. Your job, once again, as we talked about, is to, you're, you've just arrived in a rich person's house. There's too much to take away, right? Look at all those words. It's just too much. I am going to give you a copy of these lines, but this is your chance to choose a few choice things. Where are the diamonds? Where are the jewels? Where's the cash? Grab those things and leave the rest. I've given you a hint by putting the most valuable gems So first of all, Gothic Revival is the same as Neo-Gothic. It happened in the middle of the 18th century. OK, I got that. I can, I can capture that. Now here's something that's really interesting that deals with what's going on in the world right to the present. And this is where we get into this idea of what architects offer the world. Uh, the, project of establishing national identities. So construction of buildings is a project of constructing national identities. And at this moment in history, the French Revolution has just happened. This short guy with the Napoleon complex named Napoleon uh, leads the greatest army that the world has ever seen with this military precision, completely systematized. It's like a machinery that just marches across Europe. Nobody can stop it, it seems. And because of the French rational systems of thought, he conquers country after country. And he says, I conquer you in the name of French civilization. Uh, which is French civilization is staking a claim to being the universal aspirations of the human race. That's why when you get stuff from the United Nations now, it's in French. What's going on? It's left over from 200 years ago when the French army swept through Europe. So, when the French were establishing their primary, their domination over Europe, they were doing it with military force. And what else were they using? If you want to dominate a culture and society, who do you can recall? The architects. So they're using neoclassical architecture to stake the claims. When you studied Roman architecture back last fall, uh, we talked about how the Roman system of roads spreading across the Mediterranean world was a very clear demonstration of Roman superiority, that they were all straight and grid-like, right? So the, the form of man-made structures on the landscape was a clear demonstration of Roman superiority over every barbaric tribe, including the French, uh, as the Roman Empire spread across the Mediterranean world all the way up to Scotland, right? So here we, we're doing it again. The French are now saying, Neoclassical architecture, Roman architecture, is about to demonstrate on your butts. I'm going to show you that we are the French and we rule. We rock. Because we are the defenders of the universal rights of, of man. It's also, a, uh, and so to counter the French, especially after Napoleon meets his Waterloo at what town? Waterloo. See how Napoleon is so central? We have the Napoleon complex, and we 
Kevin told me in the meeting is Waterloo, not Waterloo. Uh, so after Napoleon is defeated, the other nation states trying to establish themselves in Europe say, okay, we have to establish our national identity and we would have done it using the Roman, Greco, uh, neoclassical, but Napoleon and the French kind of ruined it for us. So um, what do you got for me, architects? You got something else? Do you have something in blue, right? Do you have something alternative for me? And what did the architects say? We got you covered. We have all kinds of options available for you on special today. Can I offer you something in the Gothic? It's not neoclassical. Its primary selling point is that it's not French neoclassical. Okay, I'll take it. I'll take about 10,000 buildings in, in neoclassical. Uh, and so Germany loves the neoclassical. Remember Schenkel? And his painting that Hitler liked? And the English love the neo-Gothic. And since the US colonies are trying to distinguish themselves from England, but at the same time they're trying to compete with England, saying, I know we used to be part of the English Empire, but uh, we've left home and we're on our own now. Um, you're not the boss of me. Uh, but they still are trying to impress the world with their sophistication, and they constantly are going back to English styles. So even in the US, uh, it's all about the English. So here we go. The Germans, uh, there's the slide uh, of Schinkel's painting of this hyper lightweight uh, Gothic tower, impossibly lightweight, except Schinkel envisioned it. He painted it. He offered it to German society as the German nation state was taking form. And sure enough, the Germans say, I love it, Jingle. Let's, let's finally finish Cologne Cathedral. And so after centuries of the Cologne Cathedral just sitting there unfinished, the Germans say, let's finish this Cologne Cathedral. And it's a complete celebration of oldness, except for a few things. They use modern technology. They use iron in the roof. They built it higher than any cathedral has ever been built before. As a matter of fact, it becomes the tallest building in the world. And somewhere I read that it uh, was surpassed only by the Washington Monument four years later. But I think that might not be true. Or maybe the Washington Monument was surpassed in 1883 by the Brooklyn Bridge. The Brooklyn Bridge was the tallest building in the world in 1883. But don't believe me, verify that. I'm not sure what the sequence is. So there's Hitler's favorite painting. Here's the Cologne Cathedral. So I made a claim that the Neo-Gothic is a useful instrument deployed by leaders, employing architects. It's a useful instrument for establishing a cultural identity upon which to construct the modern nation state of Germany which was kind of a made up thing. All the little kingdoms were brought together in the Prussian Empire, and then they said, hey, there's a new thing, it's called the nation state, we gotta get us one of those, and they said, okay, let's get one. Let's, let's consolidate these kingdoms and, the, and let's consolidate these different uh, kingdoms in the Prussian Empire, and let's call it Germany. And so they needed an architecture uh, to rally the population. So I'm making these bold claims about the formation, the role of architecture in the formation of the modern nation state of Germany. I better have some pretty good evidence. Are you buying it? Do you believe me? I'm trying. 
Um, so here's uh, some of the, even though Schinkel was a very uh, sophisticated architect, he's the one, what did he build here that we saw last time? Was it Gothic? No. no. We didn't look at any Gothic last time. Right? So Schinkel is this hero of uh, neoclassicism in Germany. But he's an architect. He says, oh, you don't want the neoclassical today? Can I offer you something from this rack? We have a whole selection of this season's newest models of neoclassical. And so he can go either way. And so there's a lot of that in the 18th and 19th centuries. So here we go. Here's Schinkel's uh, celebration. Even though he was capable of doing these remarkable, rational, stage set pieces of classical architecture, neoclassical architecture, he's also very capable of starting with the principles of the Gothic and just going to town, the details of this, uh, of his work are just remarkable. And one of the reasons we love the Gothic so much is because of the material voluptuousness of it, the, uh, the strenuous expression of structure. Um, in Tech One, when I used to teach it, we used to learn about how masonry arches work. And we did that by uh, taking sugar cubes and hanging them from a piece of tape, and then tracing the shape of the sugar cubes. What's that shape called? It's, uh, it's, 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 it's parabola is a big category. It's a subset. It's a specific kind of parabola. So the Gothic, the form of the Gothic, it's not just some guy making up a shape out of thin air. It is a scientifically demonstrable pure form that is the purest, most efficient shape for a, an arch in pure compression. It's almost like God gave it to us, or the forces of nature, or something in between or both, depending on what your preference is. But there's something about the Gothic that is so pure and scientifically rigorous 
Unlike the classical, which has these round arches, which, you know, what's that? Sure, it's pretty. Sure, it's the result of pure geometry of a single radius curve of the Roman arch. Uh, it's not very scientific. And in the age of the Enlightenment, we kind of need to move away from these faith-based architectures and move towards something more scientific. But at the same time, it's also, ironically, very godlike. Right? It is the most Catholic of architectural forms. So if you are trying to establish a nation state and built on the foundation of moral virtues, of religious piety, of uh, moral uh, superiority over the other people you're conquering. And who are we conquering at this point? Who's, who are the British conquerors? Africa. Who else is the British country? India. India. Who else is the British country? China. China. Who else? Pretty much everyone. Thank you. We don't have time for this. Who is the British? Who are the British conquering? Everyone. No one is not being conquered by the British. Makes it easy. If we have a multiple choice test and it says which of the following. Uh, are the British conquering, just skip to the end where it says all of the above, no matter how long the list is. So, if you're going to conquer everybody else in the whole world, you had better have God on your side, right? So, uh, Pugin, who was a very prolific architect, uh, he converted to Catholicism, and he doesn't just say this is the, the most pious and religiously correct uh, architecture, he says, this is how we're going to save English society from the vices and problems of the Industrial Revolution. So that's what's happening. Colonialism happens, and the Industrial Revolution happens, but not one after the other the way your eighth grade social studies teacher taught you. And the Industrial Revolution could never have happened without the cotton and the sugar and the coal everything that was supplied by the colonization. First Ireland and then the rest of the world. Right? So the colonial project and the industrial projects are the same project. There's the visual I'm showing you. It's not two separate things. It's one thing. And so Pugin uh, is saying that all of these horrible things that are happening with the industrial revolution, the cities are filling with smoke and coal and dirt and poverty and misery. And uh, you know we don't have to buy into this entire package of uh, modern modernity, modern life of the Industrial Revolution. We have a choice. We can either uh, move ahead as uh, uncritically embracing whatever the Industrial Revolution throws at us, or we can be highly critical and say, no thanks, I'm going to do something more deliberate. And so that's the point where uh, Pugin becomes a politician. Hitler wasn't the only architect or failed architect who became, went into politics. So he gives us, he uses the tools of architecture, drawing to try to convince us, to give us visual evidence, to help us make up our minds what we want to do. You can have uh, scene A, which is this bucolic townscape of the medieval world in the year 1440, the Catholic city, the Catholic town in 1440. There's the church, and the bridge, and the wall, and all these steeples, and the people tending the landscape in the pastoral, the calm, and quiet, English landscape. Fast forward four centuries, you get the industrial milk town with the sewage and the, and 
industrial waste being dumped into the river, the smokestacks. Uh, what few steeples still exist, this steeple is broken off. Uh, and the church goes from being Gothic to being classical. Ooh, we hate classical, so Fugin and Sing. And then what's this thing? Prison. How, do, how do we know it's a prison? Because it's in a circle. Why are prisons in a circle? So that the main person can keep an eye on everyone? Yes, points. That's pretty impressive. So the main person, so the one guard can keep an eye on everybody. Right? What's that called? We live in a panopticon now, not an architectural panopticon, but a, an electronic panopticon. So there's the panopticon right there, demonstrating how horrible this city of the future is. And wouldn't it be great if we could just reconstruct a medieval society and through its architecture? So architecture is one element of a cultural package. That, ha that permeates everything. And so Pugin goes on to uh, design 100 or so churches. Just he's very prolific. So you notice there's no red print here. We're not going to ask you to spit back uh, Pugin's first three names. We're not going to ask you to spit back when he was born and when he died. We don't really care about the name and location of this church. We're just providing you some visual evidence that Pugin was a prolific Gothic architect who built lots and lots of things all over uh, the United Kingdom, or at that time it was just being moved from England to become Britain, Great Britain. And we see stuff like this all over the United States. Did you ever wonder why uh, in the modern world there is so much old looking stuff that's still being built? Excellent question. You can look into that. But wait a minute, here's some red print. What's going on here? This must be important. So something happened uh, in 1834, the House of Parliament in the Palace of Westminster, in the heart of London, at the heart of Great Britain, England, soon to be Great Britain, this idea of the nation state of, of the British Isles. It burns to the ground. Horrible loss and tragedy. But when I talked to my architect, he says, yes, I'm sorry for your loss. Well, what a fantastic opportunity, right? Who's with me? What's it an opportunity to do? What's the opportunity? Yeah. Rebuild. Rebuild. And, uh, but why? Why is rebuilding a great opportunity? You can change the face of England. You can give England an identity where before it was just a collection of you know, different towns. And, uh, you can say, this is what it means to be a British citizen. And remember, we, the British, are not just, at this point, we're not just trying to hold together the towns around London. We're trying to hold together Ireland. Wales, Scotland, and that's it, right? No. All those people that we were at war with, all the people we were conquering, we're going to hold them together too. Queen Victoria is the queen of us all in the United States, uh, not at this point, but in Canada, in Australia, in Africa, in uh, the Falkland Islands. Um, all over the place. 
And so here's a great opportunity to nation build. And so what's that thing on the right there? What is it? The clock, yeah. It's just a clock, right? OK, next slide. Wait a minute. That's not just a clock. It's Big Ben. Thank you. So um, it's neo-Gothic, but it's bigger than anything that has ever been built before in the Gothic style. In order to build something so complex and so vast, how do the architects do it? And it's, remember, Fugin is one of these architects. Poor Charles Berry, we don't really remember his name. So we don't expect you to remember his name because none of us remember his name. Charles Berry was the one who won the competition. He brought Fugin in and it's kind of an afterthought. But Fugin is credited with the, the obsessive uh, attention to detail. Some say that he actually lost his mind in the execution of this project. He was so obsessed with the details of the Gothic. But do you see a grid? Do you see an organizing grid? And what does that remind you of? What connection can you make between this Gothic plan and something else you've studied? The universal grid. Point. Do you remember Durand, the French guy, who came up with this universal system of architecture? It wasn't Gothic, but it works. It's a plan, a modular plan idea that works in Gothic uh, execution. OK. So in the meantime, uh, Gothic especially after the Houses of Parliament, the House of Parliament uh, and the Palace of Westminster gets done in this new national style, the Gothic takes off and uh, churches all over England and especially the campuses, uh, civic buildings and campus architecture becomes uh, Gothicized. And after the, the universities at Oxford and Cambridge become redone, these were, these were Catholic, institutions, once they become fully Gothicized, what happens to the universities in the United States? Not Wentworth so much, but remember those other schools you looked at before you chose to come to London? What did the dorms look like? Prisons. Prisons? That's not the thing I'm talking about. What are some of the schools you visited Names Pratt. We don't have dorms. We have dorms? Are they done about it? What schools did you hear? You just came to Lamberth? You didn't shop around? Well, chances are I don't know these schools so well, but I bet they had Gothic dormitories. Did they? No? See, I'm saying something, and I don't have a picture for it, so this is your chance. Say, no, that's not true, Professor, with all due respect. Do I have a room? Which one? Yeah. Yale University. Gothic dormitory style. They still, Tufts just built one. I just went through it. It was built in the 90s and it's all Gothic. Okay, St. Pancras Station. We don't have time to talk about this. It will come up again, I bet. I'm not sure, but I bet it will. Here's what the main entry of St. Pancras Station looks like. Right? What do you think it looks like behind this facade. Remember, it's a train station. 
Just think about it. Okay, so the British are doing this nation building thing, and they're doing it all over the world. Um, so what's our favorite place to visit when we're talking about British colonies? What's our second place, favorite place to visit? India. So um, one thing that's worth mentioning is in 1639, the British establish a port town on the coast of the south, the east coast of India. And they're building it pretty much from scratch. If you're, if you're going to uh, collect the commodities of being grown in the colonies, you, what you do is you find a port. Because the key instrument, the key architecture of colonialism is the ship. The ships that were developed in the uh, 16th, uh, 15th, 16th, and 17th century, the most effective one was called the Indian Man. And the Indian Man ship model, uh, various uh, versions of it, could hold a lot of cargo and it could have cannons on it. And it could travel a long distance self sufficiently. It was the key instrument of colonial expansion. But what you need, if you have an Indian man ship, you need a port. You need a, a deep enough port, a place you can get up close to the dock. And, uh, and you need to be able to protect it. So you need a fortified port uh, so that the ship can pick up the goods. Later, you need railways that radiate out from the port so that you can grab commodities from all over and pull it into the port put it on the ship and send it back to England. So in order to, for this machinery to work, and remember colonialism is one of the biggest projects uh, in human history, you build cities. Cities are a key machine for making the colonial project work. And one of the key ingredients to that machine is you need to take a handful of British citizens, colonial officers, and put them in the midst this vast population of the colony, and they have to, with great confidence, believe that they're not going to be overwhelmed and slaughtered for exploiting the people. So step one, win the people over and say, I'm doing it for your good. I'm bringing you God. I'm bringing you civilization. Look at this great train station. Look at these great uh, cutlery and silverware and plates from, from China around the world. But look at all these great things we're bringing you. And secondly, it's good to have a backup plan in case that doesn't work. You put a layer of military protection around your English colonial officers. So they invented the white town. This is the first time that we have official racial segregation in such an overt way. And uh, because it's still going on today, it's a very important reference point, 1639 city of Madras. But here it is in Calcutta. Uh, there's the colonial trade routes. Here's uh, how this military arrangement works. Um, you put a port here along the waterfront. Here's the esplanade where the ships can uh, bring things in and take things back to England. Um, so you have that whole waterfront for that. But you also have uh, architectural demonstrations of cultural superiority. We're bringing you civilization in exchange for all your cotton and opium, etc. And uh, don't get any ideas because we have a strong military force here. And so you bring in the architecture, and the first wave of architecture in the British establishment of authority in the colonies is, of course, neoclassical. And so uh, the, the uh, peoples of India have never seen anything like this. So just as the Romans conquered the Mediterranean world uh, several hundred years earlier, the British are using the same architectural message to claim superiority over uh, the indigenous populations of India. And they're doing it um, through this architecture 
Charles Wyatt was just a lieutenant in the military and the new governor general of the British East Indies, Indies said, hey, we need a symbol of power and authority. What you got for me? And he said, I'm just a military man. I'm just an engineer. I don't know about architecture. So he called up his uncles. One of his uncles, both of his uncles were well placed in the building trades. Uh, one of them had helped work on Robert Adams Chettleston Hall and uh, in Derbyshire. And so he said, I can, I can get you uh, a replica of the Derbyshire. And so here we have a comparison between Kettleston Hall in Derbyshire and the government house in Calcutta. Uh, and so this is just uh, a rich person's house in England. So they had to expand it a bit. Uh, to perform the task of intimidating and impressing an entire continent, subcontinent. And so here's uh, the outcome. Uh, and this is architecture doing what it, it does, demonstrating power and superiority. And here's the esplanade where uh, the goods come in and out. Uh, more views of uh, important architecture demonstrating British superiority through architectural uh, expression. But then the Houses of Parliament happens. And the message comes in from the Home Office in London saying, OK, all your neoclassical stuff, forget about it. The new approach is the Gothic. So everything you were going to do in neoclassical, do it in Gothic. So here's the Victoria Terminus in Bombay. Here's the interior. It could have been done in neoclassical, but uh, these, these fashions switched to uh, the neo-Gothic. Now it's a train station, so this is just like St. Pancras. Instead of keeping on showing you examples from London, I'm, I'm demonstrating for you that when I say English, I don't mean England. I don't mean just England. Of course, I mean England, but I don't mean just England. The English system is a global system at this point in history. It is everywhere. So any chance I get to show you an example in London or an example in Bombay in India, I'm going to show you the example in Bombay. It's the same architectural strategy, a neo-Gothic building in the front, and then a train shed in the back. So hold on to your seats. Look at this train shed in the back. It doesn't look like the front. There's this new material. It's called iron. It's not so new. It's been around since the Iron Age. But the architectural use of it to create these long spans is fairly new. It's a difficult material to work with uh, because it's brittle and it's prone to fires that will fail in fire. That's why we don't use iron anymore in architecture. And you, you know about this, right? You saw this, right? What is this? What is it? Yeah, some dog playing there. Who saw it? So the, a lot of scenes in the movie take place in the historic center of Bombay, which is now called, what is it called? Mumbai, right? Why did they change the name to Mumbai? Why did they change the name to Mumbai? Because Bombay was a British name, and the Indian, the nation state of India needs to reclaim its heritage. OK? So, uh, but still, the Victoria Terminus, which now has, the name has been changed uh, to something. So they've reclaimed it. It's now the Chhatrapati Shivaji in Mumbai. And the government house is now called uh, the Raj Bhavan. So everything is renamed in a project of reclaiming the cultural national identity of India away from Britishness. 
And yet at the same time, Slumdog Millionaire is a cultural uh, demonstration of how important all this British stuff is and how the long process since independence, uh, how long it takes to reclaim uh, the cultural identity of the original population of India. So this guy, George Gilbert Scott, uh, did a lot of Gothic architecture in England, and then he did a lot of Gothic architecture in India. And the British neo-Gothic architecture in India ends up having a profound impact on the architectural uh, evolution and expansion of Indian architecture when the local kings, the Maharajas of India, that uh, still have some authority, even under British colonial rule, these kings uh, start to uh, associate power and authority and prestige with British architecture. So they start to bring in certain elements. And you get this hybrid architectural expression that comes in. So one of the things that happens, we can look back now at what Pugin is doing. Uh, he's saying the old stuff is better than the new stuff. He's looking at the development of the modern world and saying, the modern world is dirty, it's full of sin uh, and temptation, poverty, uh, death, destruction, uh, pollution, waste. It's not a good thing. They start to romantic, people like Pugin uh, start to look romantically back to a past that may have never been so great. The Black Death, the plague, some, there was always poverty, but still there's a very strong push to romanticize the past. And so with the rise of the modern world, there is a counter uh, force that is the rejection of the modern world. And so one of the important themes that you will recognize from the world to the present day is that there is this thing in the United States we call it historic preservation. In the rest of the world, we call it heritage con conservation. It's a much healthier name. Uh, at Wentworth, we call it adaptive reuse. Um, maybe you can figure out what that means. But uh, at the core of these historic preservation movements are the fact that uh, they are two sides of the same coin, modernization and the impulse towards preservation. They came up at the same time, and they are two sides of the same coin. If it hadn't been for rapid change of the modern world, there would be no appeal, or the appeal for preservation would be far uh, lower. Now, um, Ruskin inherited the task from Pugin in England of being the champion of everything that's old. And he wrote extensively. He wrote The Stones of Venice, celebrating the uh, charms of Venice. And he wrote um, uh, the Seven Lamps of Architecture, which we have more on in a second. But he claimed that the worst thing you can do to an old building is to restore it, because that erases all the age value. He, saw, he felt that the greatest value in old buildings was in the fact that they were old. And to restore an old building is to kind of erase and write over the value. Whereas the French guy, who we've already seen in this course, remember the primitive hut, uh, Violet Le Doux? Uh, his approach to the, the primitive hut was the one where you just pull the branches together and you create a Gothic vault out of the trees, as opposed to Logier's primitive hut with a pediment. Um, and so Violet Le Doux was not just a proponent of the Gothic. He was also a proponent of taking the logic of the Gothic and extending it for the, the current age. 
And so he said, it's only logical that if we take the principles of Gothic architecture and we keep them going, that we uh, take iron and we start to employ iron as a more efficient form of stone, which is not crazy because iron is brittle the way stone is brittle. Iron can handle more tension, tension forces than the stone can not a lot more. Iron has this crystalline structure that makes it uh, shatter when, it's, uh, when it breaks. And so you kind of have to treat iron the way you would treat stone. And so you try to keep it in compression. And so here's his speculation on how if the Gothic architects had continued to build in the manner of the Gothic, and using iron elements, this is what they would start doing. And since this never really happened so much, this looks very strange to us today. So here's Ruskin's Seven Lamps of Architecture. He's very much promoting uh, architecture of the past. This is not red that I added, so I, I wish it weren't red. None of these things are important. There are seven books, and there are seven lamps. If there is anything important about the content of this slide, it's that all the lamps flicker. I think this is a fascinating thing. When you look at architecture, it doesn't spell out what it means uh, in words. It kind of leaves it an open question. So everyone who experiences architecture uh, is confronted with the challenge of figuring out what architecture means because no one's going to tell us what it means. You have to figure it out for yourself. And so architecture is like a lamp. Its light flickers. It becomes bright and clear, but then fades just as quickly. And all of these lamps, of these lamps, and I'm not sure this is right, I always thought memory was the seventh lamp. So now I'm contesting what it says here. I'm going to look it up. I think memory is the seventh and most important lamp because Ruskin was a guy who said, uh, it's not important what we think so much. It's not important what the architecture actually is. The important thing is humanity and the intentions of humanity. And he actually has something to say about making. Make it very well or make it a little rough, but make it. The important thing is the human hand and the sincerity of the act of making, even if it's not perfect. It's the sincerity of the act of making, even if it's not perfect. I think that would be a good thing for us to do in studio. Yeah, so here we have the great respect for the craftsman. Uh, it's not about the building so much as the experience of humanity. So you want the imprint of the craftsman in everything. And so he was part of this long British tradition of celebrating the handicrafts. And we even have a movement that we're going to get to later in the semester called the Arts and Crafts Movement and William Morris promoting the uh, pushing back against mass production. Uh, that comes with indu the Industrial Revolution. So his books, The Stones of Venice, uh, he really admired Italian Gothic, which tended uh, to be more closely bridging the gaps between the classical and the Gothic. So Ruskin is the English theoretician of preservation, and he says, Keep the age, the imprint of the human hand. Keep that imprint of the human humanity of the craftsman. Keep that back. That's what's valuable. The age value of the architecture is where the value is. Now, that's the, he's trying to establish an, an English approach to heritage conservation. I'm not going to say that that is the English approach, because clearly it's not. But he had a big influence on the English approach to heritage conservation age value being the most important thing. Now opposed to that was Viollet-le-Duc. He's the guy who had the iron 
uh, elements employed in a Gothic manner. He didn't have any qualms about taking old architecture and finishing it the way they did in Cologne Cathedral at the beginning of the lecture in Germany. He said, um, let's just make it better. Let's complete the incomplete project of the Gothic. Let's use iron elements freely uh, in the way the Gothic logic would have us use it. And so he proposes uh, finishing the squared off towers of Notre Dame in Paris. He even uh, proposes the spire at the center uh, of the crossing and put a statue of himself at the top of it. So he uh, is very much uh, a proponent of the Gothic spirit as a modern movement. And the term Gothic was actually applied retroactively to Gothic architecture. Uh, it used to be called pointed architecture because of the shape of the arches versus round architecture, which was the classical. Uh, and people used to make fun of it, call it the Gothic, until uh, they, the Gothic architecture and Gothic proponents embraced it as being uh, a good thing. So they were accused of being all goth, I guess. And they said, yeah, we're goth. Um, and so it became, uh, in, in Violet Le Duc's eyes, it's an appropriate uh, foundation for modernism. Which brings us to the last character in our story today, which is Henri Le Brust. And that name should be in red, because this project is very important. So Henri Le Brust is a French architect. Uh, he was a big fan uh, of classicism. He was a classical architect. He's, here you see him studying Roman uh, form, the, the round vaulting of the Roman vaulted architecture, uh, the heaviness of the masonry. And he gets a commission to do uh, the Bibliothèque Sainte Genevieve right next door to that church of Sainte Genevieve that we looked at uh, in the earlier lecture. And I mentioned that there was a library right next door, which I, I always get very excited about, the library. Um, the church of Sainte Genevieve is the one that after the French Revolution and the unsettling of the church at the center of French society. It was renamed, what was the French church renamed to get away from God? It was very confusing because it was already building in that name. The Pantheon, thank you. And so Saint Genevieve, the library gets built. Any pointed arches here? No pointed arches. Is this Gothic? Not Gothic. But is there anything Gothic about it? Let's take a look. So before we dig into this, let's take this out. It's time for the in-class exercise. Now, you could say it in French or you could say it in English. What is it? What is it in English? Library? Saint? And what's Genevieve in English? Gen? Any Gen person? This would be very popular. Genevieve is. 
I would keep it Saint-Genevieve. If you say St. Jennifer, I don't think anyone would know what you're talking about. And I say the place. I, I don't say the city, I don't say the country. Sometimes the place is enough. If you say Paris, you need to say France? It would be Paris, maybe. Is it Paris, maybe? Is it Paris, New Hampshire? It's a lot of Paris. And who's the creator? Henri Le Bruce? I, I know him as Le Bruce. I, 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 my pockets aren't that big. I, can, I can't carry around all these names. Right? I'm good with just the last name myself. I highly recommend grabbing that last name, putting it in your pocket, leave all the other things alone. You don't need them. Durant, Boulet, Le Doux. Right? Easy. Easy to remember just one name, much harder. Well be what was Fugit's first name? He's got three of them. I recommend one name. Bruce. And here it has two dates, 1843-1950. Who thinks we should use the year as finished in first mission? Who's with me? Here it's finished in first mission. That's not crazy. That's no crazy. Who thinks it should be the year it was conceived and begun? Three of us. I think the year it was conceived. Because we're studying architecture, right? What year did the architect think it up? But you can disagree with me. I think the year was thought of. It's the one that matters. So do what you think is right, because you're taking uh, responsibility for your own education. So this image is reproduced more darkly than it should. Um, but it should allow you to draw over it. What? Things are in this picture that are noteworthy. If I were you, I would trace over this image. The intention is that you trace over the image uh, on the things that are noteworthy. And so let's go through the lecture and see what is noteworthy. Now, some of the noteworthy things about this building are in this picture given to you. Other noteworthy things should be drawn on the back as sketches, at least three sketches. Does that sound familiar? So draw at least three sketches that capture the things that are noteworthy about this building. So let's run through it. What is noteworthy about this building? First of all, it's got round arches, and it's got a masonry facade. So it's very familiar to us as a neoclassical building. It's even got this festooning stonework, which is an element of the Baroque here. So it's unapologetically uh, locked in the past when you approach it from the outside. It's got rougher stonework at the bottom. Remember the rustication of Palazzos in Florence last fall. We studied Renaissance palazzo, palaces, palazzo. So it's got a rusticated, rough stonework on the bottom, slightly more polished stone, but larger. And even more light colored and more polished as you go up. So there's a base, middle, and top. So it's very classical. Uh, it's got the rounded arches. Uh, and what's going on in these panels here? that texture. They're the names. Yeah, they're the names 
of some 800 writers of great civilization, the great authors of Western civilization. Their names are inscribed on the outside of this library. So it's advertising what, it's, what it means. Remember I said architecture never, architecture flickers. It doesn't really tell us what we're supposed to think it means uh, explicitly. Unless it does, sometimes the meaning we're, we, we're supposed to get out of the architecture is written literally on the walls. It's embedded in the walls, and here's an example of that. Have we seen an, an example previously of writing on the walls that explicitly tell us what to think about the architecture? There's one. Boulet. Remember Boulet? He's that French visionary architect. Uh, that means he didn't ever build any of these things. So, but he believed in writing the message on the wall itself. So, large expanses of blank masonry with messages inscribed in it. And look, here's these same. Uh, floral, these festoons of foliage decorating the facade. So it's a masonry decoration. So that's two things that you can say about the exterior of the Bruce Bibliothèque Saint Geneviève. Uh, gets these two elements. Mr. Speculating, it could be that he's being influenced by the visionary architecture, the paper architecture, of the French architect Boulet. So here's the plan view of Saint Geneviève. Which is the lower floor and which is the upper floor? But there's a lot more pochet going on over, uh, on the upper plan than on the lower plan. It suggests to me, and apparently some of you, that there's a lot more structural load on this, on where this is cut through than there is where this is cut through. And on a good day, I would have a plan of a bit higher that would show the openings of the windows. Because as you can see in the image on your paper, 
when you go up higher, the windows start to open up and let the light in, which is a big part of the experience. Now, what's the weird thing going on here and on your paper? What's noteworthy about this view? Well, the architecture. Yeah, arches. So these arches are not masonry arches. These arches are made out of iron. Anything else? Where does the iron stop? Does it stop when the arch stops? This is iron, right? What's this? Is that masonry? Yeah, so these big arches are iron, and these smaller spandrel arches are also iron, but then they stop here, and then what's this? That's masonry, right? Take a hint. Oh, wait, first a reference back to Boulet. Another Boulet picture. Labrust couldn't do it in a single span. This was new stuff, the iron arch. Uh, but he, so he compromised, he did it in a double barrel vault. But he's under the influence of Boulet again here. Okay. Where's the masonry start? And the, where's the masonry end and the iron starts as you go up? You see it? Yeah. So the masonry comes up to here. You can tell by the color. Thank you. But also by the scale, the thickness. Can you do masonry that's that thin? structures? No, you haven't taken structures. You don't know about the slenderness ratio. Do you? When do you take structures? Next semester. Next semester. Okay. We'll talk then. Okay. So you can't do something that slender in masonry. You could do it in wood, but we don't want to do it in wood. This is an important building. We want to do it in iron very much as suggested by the French guy, Viollet Le right? He was saying, let iron be the next material of the Gothic architecture. Is this Gothic architecture? No. It's classical in form, but it's Gothic in spirit as if you consider Viollet Le Duc as the uh, missing link. And so architecture marches on in this way. So what else is noteworthy? Notice how thick that facade is. So remember the, the view from the outside? It was of this massive masonry building as if it was very old and familiar. And yet on the inside, he's going all crazy. This is a brand new approach to how to do architecture. It was a revolutionary building inside, uh, but on the outside, it was, 
looked like a very classical, familiar, same old, same old Roman building technology. And it is same old Roman building technology until you get here. And when it comes time to span these, these spaces, it's using iron. Let's see what else we got. Here's this section. So just like St. Pancras Station and the Victoria Terminus in Bombay, India, you have this metal truss work that is holding up the roof. And then you have this interior space spanned by these iron arches that are very decorative and uh, could have actually been handcrafted I mean, in order to make this. Iron is a molded thing. You melt the iron and you cast it. Has anyone ever cast iron before? How did you cast iron in high school? Just for fun? Last weekend we were casting iron? And why were you casting iron? Where'd you cast? Okay, we're going to talk to you next Tuesday about what the difference between iron and steel is, and what the difference between iron, rock iron, and steel is. Better be ready. Can you do it? Okay. Can, okay. We're counting. Kind of so uh, in this section, you can really see the distinction between the masonry and the iron especially the iron for celebrating on the interior. So I don't want to distract you so you can finish this. questions on the nature of this exercise, identify the building. First of all, write the name. Second of all, identify the building. Trace elements in the image, then flip it over, draw three interrelated views. Remember we talked about the NLT. Label and explain how the key features of the architecture produce important is it enough to just use those architectural sketches, or is it useful to supplement it with a diagram? Remember, a diagram is a simple cartoon very quick. Are there any connections between this, specific features of this architecture and features of prior architectures? So notice that I'm saying features same features. We're not saying, oh yeah, San Genevieve is kind of like Boulay. That's too non-specific. You have to say what feature in San Genevieve relates to what feature in what building in Boulay. Then are there any you know about lots of architecture that's come since 18 43. Are there any things that happened since then that you can make connections with? And finally, is there anything that you're aware of today? Does this help us have insights into anything that is a current question? Of? Is there something you're doing in the studio? Something you're curious about? Any questions on how to do this? And then finally, the challenge is how fast can you do it? Can you do it in time to pass it in before you do it?
some more notes on the back. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you.